Okay. And anything that allows your loved one to think better will also allow them to act more like they used to uh, when before they had dementia. Stress re uses up resources, and these there uses that uses up resources that uh, the body needs to function properly. And this means that um, the you might see behaviors. Um, and the behavior tool, uh, the behavior management tools reduces stress. Um, and anything that adds comfort or improves quality of life uh, will help to reduce behaviors. Uh, Dr. Bateman did uh, a great job of um, talking about advantages and disadvantages of various drugs uh, for behavior manage management. And both he and Pat emphasized how you need to be your loved one's advocate. That's so important with drugs. You are the one who sees their reactions and to, the re to the prescribed drugs. If you notice a new or increased behavior, um, check to see if it might be the, uh, check to see if it might be the drugs that's causing the behavior. It could be because behaviors can cause um, problems as well as improve them. Um, LB care, LBD care partners have a slogan for drugs. Start slow, start low, go slow, and monitor carefully. Um, LBD damages a person's ability to process drugs, and so often you need a slower do or a smaller dose than um, the the normal dose, and, and a larger dose might actually make your problems worse. And of course, you want to try non-drug options first. Often these and and you want to continue with them even after you start using drugs. Often these non-drug options are all that's needed at first. They improve your quality of life, uh, both yours and your loved ones, and they're often something you can do together. <clears throat> they tend to be safer than drugs, and of course they, all, they make your life less stressful and decrease your workload as well. When drugs are used in combination with, uh, with the uh, um, non-drug options, you often get to use less. There are a multitude of non-drug options. So let's look at each one of these. Now, you're probably all aware that maintaining a, high, a healthy lifestyle includes a healthy diet, adequate sleep, lots of fluids, especially water, by the way, um, mental stimulation, and dementia experts have long said that regular exercise is better for the brain than any dementia drug. And they're now saying that socialization is equally important. There, as far as alternative therapies, there's just so many, that, and we can't possibly talk about them that we, we just don't have time to talk about these today, but that doesn't mean they're not important and that they can't help. And um, we recommend that you find some that work for you and use them for your loved one and for yourself as well. You can start that search on our webpage, lbdtools.com. Remember Lucy, before we, go further, I'd like to introduce my avatar, or reintroduce my avatar, Lucy. She has LBD, and just like yesterday, when she's up in the corner like this, I'm speaking for her. And when she isn't, I'm just me. And oh, by the way, neither Jim, neither me, nor my husband, neither one of us have dementia. Just, just to let you know. So remember this Mandala, mandala that's on the book cover um, that I showed you, it reminds you that dementia is like living in a foreign land with a different language and a different culture. I'm stuck here as Lucy. I'm stuck here. 
I can't, I can't change, and so I can't leave. But you can, and so you can come and visit me. Managing stress covers an awfully big area. Um, and it overlaps many other stress uh, subjects. When I express these negative emotions that are showing up here, um, it usually means that I'm stressed in some way. If you find the trigger or the irritant or the stressor, whatever you want to call it, and respond to it, you can usually see a great improvement in my behavior. Sounds simple, right? Well, it can be, but it often isn't as you well know. So you need to try to be, you need to be a detective. Whenever you see an increase in my behaviors, this thing up here is bothering me. I don't know. I, something at the top of my screen keeps me from seeing the top. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, anyway, when you, when, when you uh, see increased behaviors or new behaviors, um, you, you need to think stress. There also may be patterns, like acting out at a certain time of the day. If I do the same thing just about the same time every day, check to see what else is going on then. And check the environment for irritants. What's different now? And do a body review. Um, is um, often my behavior is a signal that I have a hurt that I can't understand or describe. And remember drugs. Check if I've um, just started a, a new drug, that might be the problem, or even just an increase, or maybe, maybe it's a decrease in drugs. Um, so check that too. And finally, you. Your, you and your interactions can be it can trigger my behavior. So, in fact, you might be my greatest stressor. If you don't get enough sleep, uh, if you feel often feel overwhelmed, or if you don't have any help, you're likely stressed out. And if you are, so am I. Care partners often don't put themselves first. Um, but self-care is a key behavior management tool. If you don't take care of yourself, anything else you do just won't work as well. Support groups give you a place to learn, share, and vent. Personal time helps you to remember that you're more than just a caregiver. And it might be just five minutes, but it's important longer times away from home, from me and my behaviors can energize you and help you get back a sense of balance. Support from friends and family can provide emotional and physical support. And don't wait for them to offer. Ask for help. They may not know how to help, but they'll be glad to do it if you ask. And I need you to take care of yourself. Because if you don't, remember, your stress is my stress. A lot of what I'll be talking about today involves responsive interactions. Remember what I said earlier about working um, with dementia is like learning a foreign language and culture? Being responsive often gets rejected because it requires you to learn about that new language and new lifestyle. And then... I need you to go a step further and make it a, a go, I need you to go a step further and make responding a habit so that it comes naturally to you. You'll find this is worthwhile when working with me, but it's also works pretty well with just about everyone. Before we talk Let me talk about reacting first. That's my only choice, my only language, if you will. I act on the first information that my brain gets, 
without any thought of consequences. Actually, people do this a lot, especially when feelings are strong. You might call it a gut reaction. That's close. It's an automatic acceptance of whatever emotions pops up first with actions to match. On the other hand, responding means you take the time to consider the situation. For example, if I do something irritating, you recognize that you're irritated. Now, we know negative em emotions demand action, but that action can be a choice not to act. And so you choose not to show your irritation. Instead, you make a conscious choice to smile and leave the room for a while. You know this will support me while giving you time to cool off. Making conscious choices aren't in automatic. And so if you need, if, if you wanna make this a way of life, it requires practice and a willingness to change. Yes, the way you interact can trigger behaviors or decrease them. But you can make a conscious choice to respond instead of automatically reacting. I can't, but I can follow. I can follow your lead. Before we talk any more about choosing, let's talk about what not to choose. First of all, don't explain. Remember how I felt yesterday when Helen tried to convince you that you really didn't live in your home? Even though you knew it was play acting, you had some negative feelings, didn't you? Yesterday, Helen asked you how much stronger you thought my reaction would be when I'm seriously defending my only truth. Well, let me tell you, I feel discounted and frustrated. And of course, I can no longer, and, and in addition, I can no longer experience levels of intensity. I'm either just fine or it's awful. And so I'm not upset. I'm very upset with major behaviors to match. Don't defend. When I accuse you of something you didn't do, your first thought will naturally be to defend. This gentleman from the 1700s expresses exactly how I feel when you do that. I can't understand why you're lying to me and I'm hurt and angry. My truth is the only reality I have. And unless you support it, my negative emotions will block all communication and drive my behavior. Don't argue. My feelings radar, radar make me feel very sensitive to feelings. And when you model or express anger, I pick it up and add it to my own negative feelings. And it just makes my behavior worse. Oh, and by the way, it works the same way for you too. But you can make a conscious effort not to let my anger trigger you. Remember, you can do that. I can't. And don't defend. Oops. When I accuse you of something you didn't do, oops. Um, the, your first thought is naturally going to be defend. Legit, this, okay. I just did that. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't get to do this earlier this morning like I did yesterday, so I'm lost. <laughs> I didn't, we don't argue, and none of them work. Explaining, arguing, and defending don't work. They all require that I accept your reality and that I think rationally. Two things that I can no longer do. And so if you do any of these, we will both feel unheard and both of us will try harder and we'll both end up feeling stressed and frustrated. And then guess what happens? Right, my behaviors increase. Oh, and so will yours. Instead, 
be an actor in my drama. This is a four step process. Validate my truth, join in my reality, and then help me move away from stressful negatives and refocus on something more pleasant. Validation starts with listening it un um, and accepting my truth. This shows that you respect my views. Agree with me. You know, sometimes agreeing can be difficult, but you can always nod. And you can repeat what I've said. This tells me that you heard me. And when I feel heard and understood and respected, my negative emotions stop screaming at me. And I can pay attention to you and hear what you have to say. The next step is to join my reality, to visit me in dementia land, if you will, so that we're speaking the same language. Just go with the flow. And while you're at it, look for issues that might be need addressing, then act by making suggestions that move us into a more positive direction. Offer help if it's needed. And when I feel supported, I'll relax and there'll be even fewer negatives. Finally, distract. Distractions, redirections, and bribes all have the same goal of getting me to refocus my um, and change my focus. This can be easy because I have a very short attention span, but it only works if you've gotten rid of those pesky negative emotions so that I can pay attention to you. Use, um, use invitations. Directives feel controlling and may trigger my resistance. Uh, would you like to take a nap? Feels a lot more comfortable than you need to take a nap. It feels attractive to me and I, I'd probably agree to that, to invitations. I like to get along. Yeah. Would you like to? Would you like to do something? Um, there's a lot of ways to distract me. And here's a few. As dementia takes away my ability to taste, my sweet buds are the last ones to go. So I love sweets. Physically going somewhere else uh, gives me new vis visual cues to, to think about, and, and that can distract me. Asking for help help works well, too. I like feeling useful. Have a basket of laundry that I can fold, for example. Since I only know now and don't know, I don't know that I'm doing it over and over. Or suggest an activity like I, I enjoy, like listening to music on my headset. But the distraction I like best is when we do something together. Let's go for a walk or let's look at your photo album. Usually hooks me in. OK, let's see this in action. If I tell you that I see a little boy sitting on the floor, don't try to explain him away. Remember, I can't accept your explanations anymore. Instead, be an actor in my drama. Accept and validate by listening and showing interest. Join my reality and check my feelings. Ask me if I'm okay with him being there. If I am, nod and smile. Your job is done. However, I might be feeling anxious. I might be worried that the baby, the little boy is lost and he needs his mama. If that's the case, help me move away from my stress. You might offer to help the little boy go home. Once you have my permission, say something like, Oh, there's your mama. I'll take you to her. Then guide the child out the door and return with an announcement of success and offer a distraction. Let's talk about anger. When I'm angry, I'm stuck and I can't move on. So don't argue or defend. Instead, deflect or help me replace my anger with positive feelings. If I accuse you of stealing my slippers, make an effort to stay calm. You don't want to model anger, but you don't want to laugh either. Then validate me so I feel heard. Enjoy my reality. 
and repeat my complaint. You feel, and, and em, while you're at it, empathize with my feelings too. You feel angry about losing, about your slippers being stolen. Once, I, once you have my attention, you can offer support. You can, uh, if I'm accusing you and you know where the slippers are, you might offer to give them back. If I'm accusing someone else, you might offer to go get them back. But more important, most importantly, apologize. Yes, apologize. Apologies are great behavior management tools. It's never easy to apologize for something you know you didn't do, but it works like magic if you join me in my country and accept my truth. Then when you apologize, I can stop attacking because you heard me and I feel validated. It doesn't matter whether you did it or not. You see, I believe you did. And so that's what counts. And when you, when I feel heard and validated, my anger fades. You can use this a lot too, because my logic meter is stuck and too much just doesn't compute. But my feelings radar is working fine. And so think about how sorry you are that I'm upset when you say I'm sorry and let your body language show that. Even when you aren't the cause of my stress, your actions can make a big difference. When by planning ahead, you can avoid a lot of stressors. When they're already present, you can sometimes remove them entirely or at least decrease their effort. Uh, being a fixer can be quite helpful. And here's some examples. I used, I used to love cop shows, but they're too scary now because I can't tell the difference between virtual and real events. An exciting football game can be stressful too. My brain responds to the same strong excitement, uh, the same, my brain responds the same to strong excitement as it did to, does to fear and anger. And so choose more calming shows like this. Extremes like crowds make me anxious, but I still need to be social. So invite a couple, just no more than two people to come and visit now and then. Chronic illnesses like arthritis can cause pain, but I may not be able to tell you what hurts. All I know is that I'm uncomfortable. I telegraph that to you with my behavior. It's the same with internal problems like a UTI or constipation. Get that taken care of and my behavior usually decreases. I'm super sensitive to loud noises and bright lights. You may think I'm sleeping when I'm really protecting my eyes. Try giving me sunglasses to wear, even inside. I'm most comfortable when everything around me is familiar. Variety and change have become traps that drop me into places where I no longer know how to act or be. For if I need new shoes, for instance, buy new ones that are as similar to my old ones as you can. Well, you know, maybe just a little less scuffed. In familiar places with well-known things around me, I feel safe and more in control. I can relax and my thinking and my physical abilities are both at my at the best. Use this to make necessary changes less stressful for me. If I must move, for example, make sure there's some familiar items waiting for me in my new room. Likewise, be sure to take a familiar pillow or a blanket along on a trip. I love routines. We all have them, sequences of actions that stay the same time after time. For example, I have a breakfast routine. I have the same breakfast about the same time of day in the same place every day. Routines help me feel in control of my life by allowing me to know uh, what to expect. And it comes, man, that makes it easier for me to cooperate with you. Being comfortable helps me function better. well, too. 
I chill easily. So keep me and my um, environment warm. For example, I'll be much more willing to bathe if you make sure the bathroom is heated first. My skin is sensitive, so be careful what touches me. And you know, extreme, and as you know, extremes and change make me anxious. And do remember to keep your expressions and body language relaxed and pleasant. Well, Lucy's gone, but Hank and Marjorie are back. Hank has started out to act out sexually. Uh, we're all sexual beings, uh, but um, we're all sexual beings and the sexual urge is normal. But in dementia land, if sexuality isn't replaced by apathy, it often becomes extreme and that's what's happened to Hank. Lucy could experience these urges too, but it's more common with men. In true dementia land style, Hank acts impulsively without a social filter and without any consideration for anyone but himself. My goal is to stop the, his behavior, Marjorie says, but I wanna keep him happy too. Marjorie has found that Mainly, she needs to stay calm and be consistent. She can't laugh one time and yell at him another. She's also found that it often works. Okay, it often works to tell Hank a firm but not angry no, or a busy later, followed by a quick distraction. Sometimes just moving him to a different room will deflect his brain to something besides sex. Hank's dementia is PD related, and some PD drugs can increase sexual urges. Others might too, so do check the drugs. Hank is very, very sensitive to his surroundings, and so Marjorie chooses TV shows carefully. She also monitors her own body language. But we still cuddle a lot, Marjorie says. I know that we both need that. She's right. Research, research shows that regular loving touch decreases inappropriate sexual behavior. And I think Dr. Bateman mentioned that too, and he's right on. For, um, for when Hank is, uh, uh, acts out around a person they don't know, Marjorie carries cards that allows her to apologize without upsetting, uh, without upsetting Hank. And if Hank was in a care facility and his behavior harassed the staff, Marjorie could request that he have all male caregivers. Now, this is a hot issue and uh, on support groups. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, redeal, to, to deal with. And uh, I've added more ideas in uh, the resource list that you, you have, that you will be getting. Now, these are all the resources that I've mentioned today and yesterday. Um, I do want to remind you that you can download a free copy of um, the Responsive Dementia Care book from Amazon tomorrow, starting tomorrow and ending the 14th at midnight. Starting at midnight tomorrow, tomorrow morning at midnight and um, ending 14 tomorrow on the 14th at midnight. Um, and that our publishers are offering the um, new uh, care guide um, for 20% off from their link. And the, the link to, their, um, to the book on their site is also in your resources. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Helen. We really appreciate that. Um, you shared so much good information with us. Uh, so many different approaches and things to keep in mind. Um, it was really great. We're going to do a brief question and answer right now, and then we are going to save a lot of the questions for um, after Pat's talk. But I did want to ask you, um, about a couple of specific things. The first was, if we have someone that wants to go home or is trying to leave to go to a specific place that 
either isn't safe for them or doesn't exist anymore. Can you tell us maybe some of those approaches that you um, talked about during your PowerPoint, which ones might work better for someone who is trying to go somewhere they shouldn't? Um, ask them to tell you about it. Reminiscing helps. Just ask them to talk about it. That gives them time. Um, you can always use um, you can always use time. Would you like to take a nap first before you go? And uh, they'll usually usually have forgotten about it. They'll remember it later. Or they'll think about it again later. But um, at the moment, um, it certainly isn't going to tell do any good to tell them it's not there or they can't go. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to work around that. Anything that helps them to feel comfortable in the moment. Okay. And Pat, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. Well, I mean, if it gets really intense um, and they're still uh, mobile enough that you can manage safely, um, get in the car and say, you know what? Let me, I'm not sure where that is, but let me go look around a little bit. And in the process of that ride, bringing up this, that, the other to, to redirect. I mean, this is, I'm doing this off the top of my head. I'm thinking, what would I do if John had done that? Um, that kind of thing, uh, having them call uh, a child or a friend or someone you've already designated uh, to have some discussion about that place and you give them a heads up, you can text them or, you know, sort of have them on call so that they can talk about that with somebody else who might be able to, you know, divert them in other ways. You just have to be very creative on the spot. Right. Creative is the bo is the bottom line. <laughs> and I guess we've all had the experience where we said or did something that didn't quite work. So we we go, okay, that didn't work. Let's try something else. And we exactly. Approach it's it again. trial so and error. It That's is. We all make those mistakes, huh? Can you share with me, ladies, a little bit about what we might call a so what behavior or a behavior that is is not really a problem that we let continue versus something that we definitely need to address what what kind of things might be a behavior that we just need to let happen i think hallucinations are often like that um as long as they don't bother your loved one uh, they don't need treatment you just go along with them so we Pat, go with the flow, huh? Yes, just go with the flow. As long as anything where you can go with the flow, it doesn't need treatment. And that takes change on your part. Yes. <laughs> That's, That's the hard part. <laughs> yes, yes. We had a fantastic example in the dementia caregiver class at Wake Forest, which I'm going to share a little bit about um, a little bit later. Uh, where one of our caregivers was just having the hardest time with uh, uh, lying. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. And that this is where it comes up, where the caregiver can get really stuck, especially those for whom honesty is way up on their moral scale. And they think lying is something you should not do. And this is one of those places where you have to get over yourself and you have to understand that what's called therapeutic fibbing is, is okay. And you just, uh, one of the things we said when this person was like, but I, I can't tell him something that's not true. And I'll go, so what's the worst case scenario if you do that? What's the worst thing that could happen? And she just kind of stared off. And I'm like, yeah. And what's the best case scenario if you do? Could things just kind of calm down? So, I mean, it's not, it's kind. And this is what I'm gonna talk about in a minute. It's kind, this is not lying, this is kindness. You have to reframe it and think of it in a different way. That comes up a lot uh, for a lot of caregivers is learning how to do things differently from the way they've done them before. Right. It's a word. It's an it's a foreign language mm -hmm. and a foreign country. And you can't expect. You can't. It, it just doesn't work to try to do it 
the way we've always done it. That doesn't fit anymore. The way I've so always true. done it, I love what Pat said yesterday. Don't let your past spoil your future. How, what was, that was basically the, the thought. Don't, don't let, no, that's not my words. That's Lucy Holmes words on that video. And mm -hmm. she said, mm -hmm. don't lose what you have for what you've lost. Yeah. And the translation for that, I think, is be in the moment and make that moment good so you don't lose that moment in addition to everything else you've lost. You can save these moments. Mm -hmm. But you can only save, you only want to save them if they're good and you have to make them good because Lucy can't. Yes. Right. We, we have to go into the other person's reality and that reality doesn't necessarily match our reality yes. and that's okay. We yes. have to make that adjustment because our person, our Lucy can't do that for us. So thank you so much, ladies. We're going to go ahead and take a little bit of a break.